Well, Talking Church, I am here today with Dr. Joel Mudamale, and I'm really excited. I've wanted to talk to him for a while, and uh, we're here via uh, video call. I wish we could be in the room, but I, I did find out, I found out from uh, my mom who runs our women's ministry that you'll be out with us next year for our Sparkle Women's Conference. So uh, in a yeah. year's time, we will do this again. But That's thank right. you so much for being on Talking Church today. Oh, Logan, I'm excited. Excited to be here. Excited to hang with you. And um, I guess we're going to have to wait for a full year to see each other in person. Yes. But who knows? Who knows what can happen between now and then? You never know. Very true. Very true. Now, whenever you see a DR in front of somebody's name, uh, there's a story <laughs> behind it. And so what made you want to pursue getting a doctorate? Or again, I know there's like D-min, there's PhD. Explain to us yeah. why there's a DR in front of your name, uh, assuming it's not false glory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so I have been kind of a Bible Bible nerd uh, for as long as I can um, remember. Uh, and kind of the, the irony of it is my introduction to really this passion was mythology. Uh, so some people are like, wait a minute, what? Mythology? But man, honestly, I've always been fascinated by the um, Olympians, the Greek gods. Um, I was fascinated by Roman culture, how Rome came in, um, had this incredible military might, and yet they were kind of intellectually lazy in some senses. So they're just like, we'll just jack the um, Olympian uh, gods, uh, just rename them, re do a rebrand on them, but just kind of keep them the, <laughs> the way that they are. I just, all this stuff kind of fascinated me. And so from a young age, I kind of just wanted to know, like, what's the actual story? Is there a story that's connecting all these other stories, or is this all just... Um, a fabrication of people's imagination. Uh, and that was my entry point into, into theology. My grandparents are missionaries in India. I kind of uniquely, I'm, a, I'm Indian. I was uh, an a child of an immigrant family here, uh, born and raised in the Chicagoland area. Logan, I watched Jordan, Michael Jordan, win the three-peat. I watched him repeat the three-peat. And so if we need to have a debate about Michael Jordan and LeBron, I can I can throw down on that uh, as well uh, with the best of them. And so- well, We've um, got Ant yeah, man, now, I just, so we're hoping that he turns into our Jordan. There's no chance. There's absolutely. <laughs> I've no never chance seen a championship that, but, in Minnesota in my lifetime, and so I just continue to just ask the Lord why He's caused me to suffer in this way. That's right. I think the answer to that is sanctification. Yes. He wants your your <laughs> sanctification. Um, but yeah, so I just um, kind of grew up with that uh, in my mind. I actually got my start as a worship leader. I led worship, really cared about the songs that we sung, the lyrics that we're singing. Are these actually true of who God is? Um, and then, yeah, just a long journey. Uh, I worked for a Bible software company for many years, years called Logos Bible Software. Um, ended up getting my um, seminary degree at Knox Theological Seminary along the way, an undergraduate degree from a Pentecostal charismatic. Bible College in California called Trinity Life Bible College, um, and then ended up doing a PhD in Biblical Theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so some of your people are like, whoa, you just mentioned like three different denominations. And yes, I did. And in hindsight, I think it was the best thing um, that could have ever happened to my theological formation because I was exposed to a lot of different streams. And then especially in your PhD work, um, you know, you if you're in a good place, they're not going to keep you in an echo chamber. They're going to introduce you to different streams of thought and um, ask you to be intellectually honest uh, with these thoughts and go to the text um, in terms of conclusions. And so that was my journey. I ended up doing a PhD. Uh, the PhD is a biblical theology PhD. So basically, um, I'm trying to argue, I did argue in my dissertation that Paul's household terminology in Ephesians 2, 18 through 22, um, actually has a Greco-Roman background, but Paul's a good Jewish boy. And um, the the story of Israel is in the back of his mind. And in fact, it's really important. And so I tried to trace the household terminology, um, oikos hauteo, back to the Babel narrative of Genesis 10, 11, and 12, and um, trying to point out that household in the Bible always has in mind a nuclear family, um, a kingdom, and a temple. There's a royal priesthood that's uh, included in that. And so, yeah, that was kind of uh, a snapshot of my journey. That's how I got here uh, and why I talk about theology. Yeah, you mentioned this multi denomination, you know, throughout your education. And th that was actually one of the things that intrigued me when I, when I first learned about you, um, n not too long ago, listening to other podcasts. And of course, just when you, when you see somebody or it's like, you see that red car and then you just see a red car everywhere, you know, I'm like, man, Joel is just <laughs> everywhere, you know? Um, 
But t- talk about maybe the denominational, e- even this background in education, but then in, at least f- from the outside looking in, it seems like that has has continued throughout even your ministry, your speaking, you know, seeing you speak at maybe a, a spirit-filled Pentecostal church like ours, but then also speaking at a Baptist church and, you know, speaking at a Baptist seminary or college Talk about maybe some of the things you've learned throughout that process of multi-denominational um, embrace, if, if that's the right word, because mm. I do think there are a lot of people that they don't have that experience. And, and some denominations like the Assemblies of God are quite large to where you don't really have to get outside of your bubble in life. You can just stay in it for a long time. Um, recently, you know, I just uh, finished my master's and it was kind of the same thing. Like I was reading a lot of yeah. from people that I had never heard of before. And then I do this research and say, oh my goodness, these are awesome theologians. Maybe you have a little bit different yeah. backgrounds than me, but uh, maybe, maybe just talk about your, some of your more recent experiences and how that's worked throughout, uh, you know, church ministry. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I would say is um, I have been fascinated by the fact that if you get under the surface of these different denominations and churches um, and pastoral staffs, uh, one of the things that you'll see under the under the surface is a actual, I think, love and affection for other denominations and theological ideas once they're exposed to them. Um, and so there are different people throughout history, you know, like you can have somebody who comes from a Pentecostal charismatic kind of background and they love Luther, you know, they just love Calvin and you can love Luther and Calvin and you can also disagree with parts of their theological positions. And so one of the things that I found when I'm sitting in seminary, um, in a Presbyterian spot, so my uh, seminary was Presbyterian, uh, PhD Baptist, and I'm sitting in a PhD cohort. And I'm one of the few people that kind of has this um, multifaceted theological background. And as people are talking about their differences, one of the things I just felt a compulsion for every time was, wait a minute, you know, you guys are kind of saying the same thing. You're just coming at it from different angles. And so trying to talk about the areas of commonality that we have um, is, I think, incredibly important. And maybe we should start there before we get into critique and before we get into um, divisiveness is like, whoa, we're all part of one family and the family is diverse and the family is multifaceted. And that's actually a good thing. Thing. That's a good thing theologically. That's a good thing for our human hearts. It's a good thing for our, our intellectual growth. And so um, I think that's the main thing is like, wow, there's a lot more that we have in common. We just end up being a people that major on minors, you know? Um, and I think that the push that I would have is to be careful that we're not making decisions in terms of our church unity based off of a fear hermeneutic. And what I mean by that is there's a fear if I I acknowledge something that is true or viable in a different theological camp that that could derail my entire position. And I just think that that's just unhelpful and unhealthy theological triage. I think it's very possible for you to be able to look at um, a Reformed doctrine and say, wow, there are parts of this that I really, really appreciate and that I value. And I'm pretty con- convinced of corporate election, you know? So I'm not going to go in there. And um, so my scholar friends would be like, Joel, you're picking and choosing. And I'd be like, no, I'm not picking and choosing. I'm just trying to be honest. I want to go where the text goes. I want to be honest of where the text is um, is neutral and we're left to make uh, informed decisions. And I want to be f- careful that I don't try to allow fear to determine my relationships with other people within the family of God. Yeah, it's something that I think there is a... I don't know if resurgence is the right word, but I think in at least, again, Pentecostal charismatic circles, to to use a a broad term, I think there is this resurgence towards, okay, there is a theological depth that, you know, I think maybe more um, reflective people would say maybe it was missing. I think maybe more optimistic people would say it needs to be strengthened. Um, But but I see, at least in our circles, people saying we need more theological depth because— in the world that we're living in, we we no longer can just say, I go to church and I, you know, not mm-hmm. that we ever could say that, but again, I think there was a general understanding of in schools and in, you know, communities and in the way people raise their families, scripture and, and biblical foundations are weaved throughout. And even if maybe you didn't know the theological position, you 
you kind of understood it through osmosis to where you just got it. Whereas now that's not happening among, you know, anyone under 30, they're, they're not experiencing that unless they're really growing up in a biblical foundation. And so I do find that there are friends of mine, myself included, to where you're looking at, at Sproul and Piper and, and these, these voices that, again, I had never heard of until recently. And, you know, yeah. I mean, Piper, he's in, in Minneapolis, but like, didn't really have the understanding of his theology and go and it kind of mm-hmm. in in undergrad it was like yeah well tulip is for for people who are crazy and they don't believe in free will can you believe that and you're like you know as an 18 right. year old in in uh systematic <laughs> theology i'm like yeah that's stupid you know um right but right. but now looking back just realizing i think we actually agree on like 99 percent of this stuff and and you yeah. know i had a friend who uh, is new new into reading the Bible. He he kind of said I was just a cultural Christian. He called me uh, last week and he said, hey, I have two two questions. I'm starting to read the Bible for the first time and, and I just have two questions. He said, the first one is, can you explain the Trinity to me? <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah. then he, I- Easy yeah, work, yeah. easy work. I did, I did my best to, to kind of say, all right, that was, yeah, that's just so you know, you that's one of the harder things, but here's <laughs> here's my the best I can give. And then the, the next question he said, how- how do we understand free will versus sovereignty? And I, mm-hmm. and I said, mm-hmm. I want to affirm you that you are on the right track because you, yeah, I man. said, I'm, I'm not overstating this. You pretty much asked the two hardest and most you know, difficult questions to ask in your first few months of reading scripture. And yeah. I, I do think that there are a lot of people that struggle to talk about it. Do you think it's because pastors are afraid that they're going to be labeled a certain way or put in a camp? Or do you think it's because they feel a lack of training on their own end? Yeah, I think it's both. I think there's definitely a um, a lack of training potentially in, in some spaces that just makes you feel like, um, and I think it, for the most part, for most pastors, it comes from a place of like, um, of care. Like I want to be careful with the text and I feel a weight of responsibility of shepherding these people the Lord has put in my, in my life. Well. And so I think there's a, a place that it comes from a good place, but then the challenge is if we ignore or not address these types of topics, like your friend, they're going to be exposed to them. It's not if it's when they are. And then the big question is where are they exposed to them? You know, um, and so I think that training is incredibly important, theological training. But I also think, um, you know, in March of this year, Logan I had a book come out on the topic of humility, um, and I think that humility is so incredibly important because humility is something that um, gives us uh, a sense of confidence in what we can know, but then also puts the weight of ownership of uh, off of our shoulder on things that we don't know, and so in that s- setting. To be able to tell a congregation or to some people around you is like what you just said. By the way, you just asked probably the two hardest questions that um, theologians for two thousand years have been wrestling with. Um, and there are people that love Jesus that have landed on on different sides of that equation. So let's explore together, you know, um, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to give uh, to illuminate the text to to give us personal conviction in these areas, and let's pursue unity as as we do all of these things. And so I think that um, humility is a gift that we ought to retrieve, especially from a pastoral standpoint of being able to be honest with what we don't know. And if we don't have the education, we don't have the training on it, there's really great news. We live in a, in a time and an age where there's more access to theological uh, resources and help than ever before, you know? And so I think instead of making the uh, impression that we have to be the ones that have all the answers that that can lead and shepherd people fully, uh, putting that weight off of our shoulders. I think this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, when he's like, hey, let's do this exchange of yokes, you know? Um, like, like, I'll take your... Uh, burdensome yoke. You take my easy one. It's not a removal of yokes. It's an exchange of yokes. And I think that if we took that perspective into these conversations with people, it would be incredibly helpful. And the, the last thing I would just say is last week I was at uh, Texas A&M University I was at Breakaway uh, Ministries. It's like one of the largest um, college gatherings. It was amazing, man. Um, you know, it's Reed Arena. You've got college students that come on a Tuesday night literally to study the Bible. Like, it's just like, hey, we're working through the book of Acts, you know? And so that's what I did. And the next day, um, my buddy Brian McCormick, who's the executive director of Breakaway, he kind of just said, hey, Joel's going to be at the Mac um, at, you know, uh, noon. And so you guys can bring your lunch or whatever. And uh, we both will be there to kind of ask any questions that you have. And so these college students, 
get there, place is pretty full, uh, students are in there, and we start going through questions. And here's the lineup of questions, Logan. First question I get, um, how can I trust the Bible? Second question I get, um, what are your, uh, because my big thing about Acts is you're welcome. Like you're welcome to the household of God. That's what Acts 2 is all about. Second question that I get, um, um, are LGBTQ people welcome into the household of God? Third question that I get, what's your view on annihilationism? Um, or are you an ECT, eternal conscious storm? I'm like, dude, what is, ha- are these, did they pull in all the seminary kids, you know? And it's like, no. These are kids that are getting majors in business and economics and finance and pre-med. And yet they are being exposed to theological ideas. They have real questions. Um, and I, this is just me personally. This might be like one of those unpopular opinions. And this is ironic coming from a guy who does a lot of his theological stuff online, on social media. I actually do not think <laughs> that TikTok and Instagram is the best place for you to be discipled and to grow in your theological formation. We need local pastors. We need ministry leaders. We need uh, like non-pastoral people, like in terms of like full-time vocation, people just love Jesus that are like, hey, by the way, I'm further along in this journey. Um, you want to come over to the house and we're going to barbecue and we can just talk theology, you know, and, and process through that. And so I think that we are living in an age where there's more access to information than ever before. But in that access to information, it's like, what do we do with it? And how do we process it? And uh, I am concerned in that area that uh, there's a possibility, and maybe even we're walking down that road where pastors and ministry leaders have taken a step out of that engagement. And um, the primary of discipleship is happening on social media, which honestly kind of terrifies me a little bit. Yeah, it it is quite terrifying. But also in the same way, you know, I think that that as, as people mentioned, that's where people are living, you know? And so what can mm-hmm. you do to almost set the hook to in, in, engage them in a way that brings them in versus, you know, engage them in a way that pushes them away? Um, yep. I, I, I do think that there are people who struggle and, you know, in, similarly to pastors who struggle because they feel ill-equipped, there's also people who are kind of accused of being a chameleon, right? And they the world wants strong leaders, again, maybe not as strong as um, our, our candidates we have for president, you know, not that great, but um, right. <laughs> I, I think that the world, the world's looking for truth. And then when, you know, someone with a theology background kind of says, well, this is a little bit more nuanced. I think people are worried mm-hmm. about turning people away because they want to, they want to give them the truth. And I do think that's part of why denominational fractures have happened over the years. I mean, there's, there's quite a few, but how have you had that balance as a as somebody who does again on the positive side you're you're bridging kind of between denominations you're seeing the truth and seeing a lot of beauty in in multiple different backgrounds but in the same way mm-hmm. again the accusation could be well you you're just you know hot when you're supposed to be hot you're cold when you're supposed to be cold you're you're yeah. you're gray when you're supposed to be gray or whatever it is um how yeah. have you managed that tension yeah i think i'm trying to figure it out um, because I think that is probably the biggest critique that comes my way. Um, my egalitarian friends are frustrated with me because I'm not egalitarian enough. My complementarian friends are annoyed with me because I'm not complementarian enough. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is it is a challenge. And so for me, I think one of the things I consistently turn back to is a concept called theological triage, where it's like, what are these non-negotiables of the faith that I'm going to die on that hill? Like, there is no compromise um, for me. Um, what are secondary and tertiary issues that are there? And, and I think think what I'm trying to learn to get better at is just being honest with people where I'm like, I'm just unconvinced of that argument, you know? Um, and so one of my favorite uh, scholars, a guy named Tom Schreiner, um, Tom and I disagree on a bunch of different things. His son, Patrick, was my uh, doctoral advisor. So he was my first reader as a New Testament scholar. And Tom's like a top 10 New Testament scholar, br- brilliant dude. And Tom has a book out on women in ministry that he was a contributor for. And at the very beginning of that book, um, he basically talks about the origin story of this book. And he's just like, you know, me and these other scholars, we sat around at this ETS SBL. I think it was ETS or SBL, some academic conference. And um, they're having lunch or dinner or something like that. And they begin to have this conversation. They're all friends and they all have different views. You know, you have half of them that are egalitarian. There are half of them that are complementarian. And I love what Tom says in there. He goes, um, I'm a better scholar because of their push on me. Like I'm a better follower of Jesus because of their influence in my life. And at the very end of it, he goes, and I am unconvinced of their arguments, you know? And I'm just like, dude, that's awesome. That's, that's, that's great. And so I think that we have to get better 
as a people of being able to say in areas of nuance, like I, I, I can be nuanced, but at some point I'm just going to have to say, and this is where I land, you know? So you know exactly what you're going to get from me. And that helps you frame how you read my work, how you listen to me when I'm preaching. It's like, oh, that's the context in which he, um, he approaches the text. And so I think honesty is just incredibly important. John Stott has this brilliant quote. He says that if honesty and humility go together, then pride and insanity do as well. And so um, I just, you know, I'm just like going to be honest about what I can know and try to be honest about what I can't know. And at some point I'm going to have to make a, uh, a convictional decision. And when I do so, if people uh, want to still hang, then great. And if they don't, like I can't control them. You know, I can't control how they perceive me or not. And um, I leave them in the hands of the Lord who's faithful. And then I just keep doing the thing that he's called me to do. No doubt. I, I was listening to the radio yesterday and it was sports radio. And there was a, a host that was interviewing a former pro athlete and he, they were bantering back and forth and he kind of made a cheap shot joke and it wasn't that bad, but he, they were laughing about it. And he, he later on apologized in the, the broadcast, which is quite rare nowadays, but right. he said, Hey, I just, I didn't feel good about that joke. And I want to apologize. And the, the athlete uh, who he had been friends with for 30 years said, Oh no, if you stop making jokes like that, then you're too old. And <laughs> I do think in some senses, and maybe it's, we're, I'm projecting on people, but you look at like C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien, and I think there's a, a sense of humor in in some ways that's missing from theological conversations. And I, and I don't mean humor in terms of its light conversation. We shouldn't take it seriously, but I do think that some of, I mean, brilliant people. And and I and I heard Rogan say this the other day. He said the best comics in the world are are brilliant. Their humor is mm -hmm. very hard. And I think most people think that comics and, and comedians are just knuckleheads that that just think of stupid things to say. But the truth is, you know, you know from preaching, comedy is is a, a an art form. I mean, even Jesus had some humorous yep. things that he said. He exaggerated things. I think Jesus had a lot of humorous things that he said. Totally. I think Jesus was a hilarious hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I do think that that's something that maybe is is missing a bit in in the, how we disagree. Again, among Democrats and Republicans, it's like there's no humor or levity at all. I think Reagan, you know, had a lot of humor in the way that he disagreed with people. Again, I, I wasn't really alive in that time period, but I just... I don't know if you sense that at all in, in, in your conversations that you're having when you're disagreeing. Um, I, I was just thinking about that yesterday. Yeah, um, so I think you you brought up C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and I think one of the things that maybe a lot of people may not know is that you know they weren't huge fans of each other's writing. Like, if you think about that, that's wild. <laughs> like, I don't think Tolkien was impressed at all with Lewis's world building. Um, and, uh, and yet... When, um, I think it's Lewis when he's on his deathbed, like Tolkien's right there, you know, at his side. And, and it's like, uh, how do you have arguably two of our greatest uh, literary writers and theological minds that um, would critique the mess out of each other, man, like the Inklings, like they would get in there and they would just like rip each other's work apart, which part of me wonders if that's one of the reasons why Tolkien never got out a bunch of his writing is he just lived in that, that stress of like these people that he loves and that he cherishes are also the ones who are like, your writing sucks. Like, can you imagine, can you imagine being those friends be like Tolkien, like trash that that's, that's un unwanted, like unneeded in our world. Right. Um, and yet there was a levity to it. And I think there was relationship and I think there was, um, things that they had that was relational equity that was able to, uh, make them better better people. I think the unique thing that we've got going on right now that might be a little bit different from Lewis and Tolkien um, or even Bonhoeffer and others is the impact of social media and how we've got an ability to have access to people without actually knowing them. You know, And so I think what's, what can be difficult is brevity and humor uh, aimed against other people where it's like, man, if you just knew me, you'd know, like, I'm just, I'm just joking. And the problem is like, you don't know me and I don't know you. And so now it's like, is the, there's a question of, um, of method. Is that the best way? Is that the most appropriate? And this goes back to the question of building bridges. You know, it's like, um, there are people that I will joke with, uh, online and in person and people, if they didn't have any context of our relationship, they'd be like, wow, these dudes hate each other. You know, and it's like, no, actually, we're like really good friends. I've got a buddy of mine who's a dispensationalist scholar, and I make fun of him about the rapture all the time. I'm like, I'm like, you know, like there is no rapture, Corey. Like, like you're gonna be waiting a long time, buddy. You know, uh, for that. Like when he comes, it's and and he he jokes at me. He hits me up all the time. 
people just heard us talking. They'd be like, dude, you guys hate each other. And it's like, no, we just have gone through two years of PhD work, cohort, set around tables together and disagreed and then went out afterwards and had food together and laughed and talked about why Michael Jordan is so much better <laughs> than LeBron. Like, like, I think that we need that, you know? And, um, and yeah, I think we need more, uh, bridges that are being built to connect to people so that we can get there. And also on the flip side of it, um, I think we got to stop being so sensitive. I think there's a sensitivity um, that is absolutely derailing us as well. Um, And if we could learn like the art of critique, like I'm going to critique a thought and an idea, and I'm going to do my best not to pull cheap shots at a person, um, that would be, I think, so helpful. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that comes just in in reps, like with people who are talking about preaching, like how do you become a better preacher? Well, you just have to preach more. And again, that that you can become a better uh, researcher, you can have better hermeneutic, you can ha- go get more education. All those things are true, but if you never actually get up and preach— you're not going to become a better preacher. I think the same is true with humor and criticism. I remember the first comment we got that was negative on this podcast, and it hurt. It was, wow, I can't believe somebody somebody said that. And I took it very personally. And I thought, wow, this is terrible. And I mean, it's a random anonymous YouTube account, right? That no idea who they are. Right. Um, and then shortly after that, somebody... Somebody commented on it and said, like, I know your family and I know that one of your family members did this bad thing years ago. And again, it's like when they were a teenager, they, I don't know, crashed their car or something. It was just stupid. And I just remember, man, it's like, this is crazy. And I'm just taking it personally. And the kind of the third comment you get that's negative, it's like, oh, wow, it's it's coming. Well, now, I mean, there's a lot of positive, there's a lot of negative comments. It, It doesn't hurt as bad because I realize, look, it just comes with the territory. It's not a big deal. But I do think there are so many people that right away, when they get that first bit of criticism or pushback to any position, whether it's a a podcast they launch or it's a theological position they hold or it's a political belief they have, they kind of run and hide because they're not used to this this being, you know, kind of smacked in the face a little bit. And um, the truth is anonymous accounts are probably ruining the world. (laughs) But um, Oh my gosh. But but I do think that it, it is something like what is your pain tolerance? And you know I'm I'm preaching a, a message here coming up at, at a church in Arizona. The, the cost of discipleship, right? It's it's Luke 14. Yeah. It's it's counting the cost. It's it's what Bonhoeffer wrote about. It's 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 going to cost you something. And so I do think that we need to, from a younger age, probably help encourage people to to realize that hey, you can take a. a a hit in the face and you can laugh about it and, and they might be right. Or, or, and you might learn something. I mean, there are things early on in ministry. I was 20 years old when I became a pastor and I probably will look back at some of my sermons and say, I can't believe I said that, or I thought that, but I, I meant it at the time. And I, I'm, I maybe was wrong or maybe I, I grew from it. Yeah. But I, I think that we don't give ourselves a lot of grace or we give ourselves, you know, way too much grace. And it's like, maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a tension there of, uh, and I think you need to have some people around you that know you pretty well. Where for me, it's especially on social stuff, it's like you start talking about any of these niche topics, like um, end times, or um, you know, talk people's you know um, view on the nature of the Holy Spirit. Uh, like, uh, like it's like you're starting to poke something that has so much value to an individual, and I'm like sensitive to that. I'm like, all right, I get it. And then at the same time. I think the thing that stresses me out, doesn't stress me out, it annoys me greatly, is when somebody critiques or um, says something, and I'm like, you haven't read anything that I just said. Like, you didn't, you, like if it's a 60-second clip, you literally did not listen to the whole thing. You maybe did not listen to any of it. Maybe you just read the caption on it, and you made an entire stance and view. And I'm like, man, I hate laziness. Like, I, I just That's the thing that I just cannot stand. And then simultaneously, it's like, all right, do I respond or not? Um, do I address it or not? And like, honestly, I'm just trying to learn um, and be led by the Holy Spirit. I've got a whole files uh, notes document of comments that I've replied to that have never hit the reply. You know what I mean? Like you ever do that? Like you have like a whole thing written out and you're like, oh, I'm about to just assassinate this dude. Like I'm about to get you so good. And then it's like the Holy Spirit just hits you. And it's like, all right, you know, like don't, don't reply. Just 
put it and I just have it held in this other place. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I feel you. And I think that pain tolerance is, uh, is a question that we have to ask. And at one point, is it doing damage to our souls? Like, is it, is it turning us into critical people? You know, is it turning us into a people that like view the world in such a way that it's actually incongruent with where God wants us to view the world? And having some people around you that honestly are unimpressed with you is so important. You know, like if everybody that's around you thinks that you're God's gift to the earth, like that's a problem. That's that's not going to be helpful for you in the long run. So um, fill yourself with some people that just like think that everything you do is kind of dumb. And then that's, that's going to be great for you. <laughs> that's the message of the podcast, right? Just find people who think you everything you do is dumb. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I do fear a bit of, you know, there's there's this place for the the nuance and the the wide, you know, debate and the humorous things that we're talking about. But I, I do think that some of the maybe fear of people to having that nuance is progressive theology. And um, we can go as far down as we want to on this. You know, I don't want to get anyone canceled, but at the same time, I don't care. Um, mm mm-hmm. There are there are people that claim. I mean, there always have been people that claim. But I mean, even you look at in Acts, it's like, no, this is not the gospel. This is not the Christianity. You're you know, you're doing this for selfish reasons. You're doing this to make money. You're doing this to get clout in the community. None of those reasons mm-hmm. are good reasons to claim you're a Christian. Um, right. But it, but it still is happening today. And I think again, social media is a, is a way that we're. I mean, I would have never known what these progressive theologians and pastors believe without social media. I mean, I, there's no chance. Um, right. Yet you see this stuff on timelines that, uh, again, we would say, or at least I would, I'm not, I guess I won't speak on behalf of you, but I imagine we're similar in that there are things that people say in the name of Jesus that are just blasphemy and totally not true. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think, you know, in, in a as someone who says, hey, I want to make room for multiple different perspectives, how have you said, no, I, I need to draw the line here about some of these things to where it's it's become, again, in my view, kind of a a synonymous for LGBTQ theology and progressive, mm-hmm. you know, uh, progressive theology and whatever other term you want to use. But it, it's frustrating to, to people like me but again, I don't know how how you've kind of handled that in in viewing social media. If you feel like, look, we're just going to have to make better arguments. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we're going to have to make better arguments. But I think we're also going to have to identify um, the broken the brokenness of their argument. You know, and this is where it's like ad hominem isn't helpful. But if you can get to the actual argument itself and say, well, wait a minute, um, what, like, I, I think uh, a big one is the question of abortion and the question of like life, you know, and it, and I think there is a big question right now that people are often talking about, which is, well, um, it's her body. Like, it's her body. It's her body. And I'm like, yes, you're right. It is her body. Um, but what about the body that's inside of her body? Like, what about that life inside of her, her life? And so now we've got to do a bunch of mental gymnastics in order to try to figure out how, from a physiological standpoint, that that life is not actually a life. So we can substantiate this first claim. And so that's for, for me, I'm like, well, no, let's, let's actually look at your argument and let's try to, to, um, to put you in a place of honesty where you have to at least say, I don't, you know, I, I, yeah, that's a life. That's not a life. Like, like, how do you go about doing that? And so, in so doing, I think it opens up conversations, so we can continue to dialogue around it. But it holds you in your place of conviction. And I think in places of heresy, um, I think you just have to say it, man. You just have to say it. Like, this is wrong. This is this is untrue. This is not the gospel of Jesus. Um, and there's a consequence. I think there's a consequence to people who speak untruths of the gospel. And I also believe there's a consequence for people who are silent about those things as well. Um, and so the way in which you go about it, I think is it, it is something that um, you have to be cautious about. Where I don't think it's everybody and their mom's responsibility to go out and start name dropping and blasting everybody on social media that you think is a heretic hunter. You know, like if like I think that's unhelpful and unwise. Um, I do think that there are a lot of people that have personal relationships with people that um probably need to pick up a phone call <laughs> and um and go directly to that individual and be like, listen, I'm very concerned, super concerned about your about what you're saying. Um it happened just the other day with me um with a friend of mine where I just was watching some stuff and reading some stuff and I'm just like, hey, um I'm I'm really concerned. And there's a consequence 
to this, because if this is what you're saying, and if you continue to go down this road, there is a relational cost to this, because I won't continue to associate um, in these types of ways. You know, like I want to be your friend. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you in these areas. Um, but just so you know, if you continue to go down this road, there is a relational fallout um, that I want to be honest with you about. So that's kind of how I've been trying to navigate it. Yeah, what, what, I mean, obviously, I, I, I have a number of relationships, you know, throughout the years, throughout the church, throughout the podcast, that just, there are people that they'll say something and I would say most of the time it's never, you know, I never want to be that person. But I think at some point you may be, it may be your responsibility to, no, you're the one, like you, it, you're the one that's supposed to be doing this. Um, do you think, and again, obviously like I, I don't, I'm not fishing for, for people or anything, but what types of issues would you say are important for us who have those relationships? And I would say this too, like a lot of people make the, um, well, if it's a famous person, then it's important. But if it's my buddy that's, you know, we went to Bible college with, it's not that big of a deal because he doesn't have that big of a church or he's just, church plan just kind of getting started or I know yeah. he, he, you know, he, he's got such a good heart. He's, I mean, he's dude, the, the dude knows his, he knows the main things. He didn't mean it like that. I think a lot of times we can make the excuses, like just like we, what we talked about, find people that, that don't think you're that great, who are willing to, to say those things to you. But then on the other side, we get the benefit of the doubt. And the unfortunate truth is, again, I'm, when we're talking about like theological stances, but the unfortunate truth is yeah. it goes into moral stances. It goes into moral decisions yeah. and potentially goes into to sin to where we kind of look the yeah. other way and say, well, they're so gifted and they're so great. And, and I don't know if it's really sin. One of the things is alcohol. Well, I don't know that they're really, we're drunk. You know, how many drinks, everyone handles, you know, drinks a little bit differently. Or, I mean, I don't know if they mm -hmm. were flirting. They were, I mean, they're just a charismatic person. And again, I'm, I'm painting a, a broad brush here for the sake of, of exaggeration, but I, I do think right. like, no, it, it's not until they get to sin. I mean, we've seen too many stories after story after story. I mean, Dallas is just a train yeah. wreck right now. But right. I don't know if there's there's markers for you where you say, no, this is a point where it's like, ah, I, I kind of see that a little bit differently or no, I, I feel like I need to address this. Uh, for me, if I've got a personal relationship with you, I'm going to address it. I'm going to address it at the get because of what you just said. Um, because it's a slippery slope. It's one one decision away from a total dismantling. And even that thought of if they're a celebrity or not, um, I think is so unwise. Because um, one, what cre what makes a celebrity pastor or a sub celebrity theologian? Cele like what makes them any greater of an image bearer than anybody else? You know, like that's kind of weird to me in the first place. And then in the second thing is, what do we know is going to happen in the next 10, 15 years? You know, like we don't know what's going to happen. Their church could blow up and become massive. They could they could write a book and it becomes a New York Times best selling book. You know, like um, I think of Acts seventeen twenty six through twenty nine. It's like God has determined the boundaries of our existence and um, and the, a lot of times of when we breathe. And it's like um, if that's actually true, then I think the relationships that we have with each other absolutely matter. And so if you're in a relationship with somebody, like speak out, man, say something because the last thing I think we want to be held accountable for is our silence in those. areas areas. Um, if there's hurt feelings, there's a great thing called therapy. Go to a therapist, you know, and figure this out, how to how to figure out the relational outfall. But like, I would rather um, relational tension than like destruction that happens for a person's soul. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing too, is I think we have to create clarity around the difference between a false teacher and false teaching. Um, everybody has false taught something. <laughs> At some point in time, I've jacked up stuff. Like you can look at my papers from uh, Bible college until now. I'm like, oh my gosh, that was so bad. So, so horrific. Um, what is the difference between a false teacher and false teaching? For me, um, the difference is the question question of repentance. You know, a, a false teacher, they're not going to repent for anything. They will find every reason to justify all of their behavior. You know, and they will use all kinds of great Christian jargon and theological gymnastics in order to identify why they were right. And there's kind of just a simple phrase that I have. Like, I'm my view is like, man, don't trust a theologian who doesn't walk with a limp. 
I would say that up with the pastor as well. Don't trust a pastor that doesn't walk with a limp. There's this epic story of Jacob who wrestles with God. And then at the very end of it, he walks away limping for the rest of his days. That's what the text says. The question is, why doesn't when Jacob realizes I'm wrestling with Yahweh, why doesn't as Yahweh's walking away, why is it like, hey God, by the way, hold up for a second. You know how you touched my hip and it displaced? You mind touching that bad boy one more time and putting it back in place? Because in the ancient world, if I'm about to walk around with a limp everywhere, this is horrific, right? And it, and it does and that doesn't happen. Well, why? Because I don't think that that limp is a sign of God's displeasure upon Jacob's life. I actually think that limp is a sign of divine humility that that Jacob would remember for the rest of his life. This is when I wrestled with God and I reminded myself who I am and who God is. It was a way to anchor himself in truth. And so I'm, I'm very worried about ministry leaders and just Christians in general um, that don't walk with a limp, that aren't aware of their frailty and of their weaknesses and, um, and live a life that is not vulnerable with the right people. People. I'm not talking about like you're just out there, you know, being um, uh, unwise in your vulnerability and um, and in your conversation and communication. But like, if you don't have anybody in those places, man, that is super detrimental, I think, to your soul. Let alone to the people that God brings around you in terms of influence. It, it, that's such a good response, and and I, you know, you, you read you read in the Old Testament, and there's a number of responses after a miraculous story of victory or Jericho or whatever it is. And they say, and then there's a monument there and it's there to this day. And of course we wish we knew where all of those were, but I think there's something about the Jewish tradition, you know, whether it's Passover, all these festivals that God told them to remember and gave them direction on how to do that. That I do think in, in some Christian walks, again, I don't think it's mandated for us in this, in the same way, but I do think there's a principle there that many Christians kind of, it's, it's week to week, it's week to week. And it's, oh yeah, I go to church and I, and I kind of read my Bible and I, I worship, listen to worship music in my car. And it's, and it's kind of a, just a week to week thing that I do. And it's, and it's great, but there's these marking moments. And yes, we have Christmas. Yes, we have Easter and I'm not underplaying those, but I do think there are points in, in our life that as and maybe it's as parents or as as friends to no, this was the day that I said yes to Jesus. This was the day that I was set free from, you know, like a sober anniversary that people will celebrate. But what about other things in your life? Like, do people remember the day they got baptized? Again, I don't, I was seven years old. I wish I did, but I do think, and again, those are very um, simple things, but there's even more complex. Hey, this was the year, year, it's the 10 year anniversary of when, you know, just an example of somebody like, oh, if your mom and I, that we were gonna get divorced and and somebody just shared this at our staff this week. They said, we Mm. were gonna get divorced. We had papers ready. And we restored our marriage and we're still married to this day. It's mm. the anniversary of that. Like those are those wow. moments where I think that keep your heart soft to realize what you were. Again, Paul, he talks about the thorn in his side. He, he continues to go after these things. And I, I, I think you're so right that if you're only surrounded by yes men or yes women that are going to cheer you on at how great you are, it m- might actually be the worst thing for you. You know, you, it, it, resistance, I mean, it, I, I just shared this on a, on a teaching that I just recorded, but I was reading the book, uh, The Anxious Generation by uh, Jonathan Haidt. Yeah. And he talks about yep. uh, in Arizona, there's a, a pod called Biosphere and, and their Biosphere 2, they had basically tried to recreate an ecosystem that they could maybe send into space if we needed to live on like another planet. Could they create its own ecosystem? And there were trees that were in the ecosystem and they were growing and everything was doing great. They thought this experiment's going awesome. But once the trees got so big, the trees fell over. And it was because they didn't have wind to when they were small to grow their roots deep. And, you know, I I think that that example, I mean, right as I read that, I'm like, I am using that in a sermon. But I think it's so true for us. We need people in our life. We need resistance in order to grow our roots deep. We need resistance in our theology and we need people to poke holes. We need liberal college students who are majoring in economics to come up to us and have a good argument against something that we think is the most important thing. We need to have those people because if not, just like your friend said in his book, like they they make me better. And without them, I wouldn't be the scholar that I am today. And so again, yeah. it's such a reminder I'd love to give you any last thoughts on kind of this conversation around, you know, 
contemporary theology, ap- applying it, uh, maybe a message for pastors or church leaders that feel either, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go deeper, or I'm maybe they're you know sitting in their car or mowing their lawn or doing dishes right now and they're pumping their fist. But what would be kind of your your message for those who feel like, all right, I want to handle handle that. I want to have a little bit more strength in my theology. W- what maybe are next steps or an encouragement you have to them? Yeah, I, I think one of my favorite stories is the story of this astronomer, um, Johannes Kepler. He's like the 17th century astronomer. And um, th- somebody asked him once, like, what's, what's the best definition of theology? How do you describe it? And I think Kepler's definition is so brilliant. He basically says, um, theology is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, and so I think one, and I think it goes to all the things that we were just saying. I think the danger um, that we have as pastors and theologians is um, we we want to be winsome. Like I think that's a that's a good thing. Like we want to be winsome with the text, but in so trying to be winsome with the text, it's very possible for us to try to be creative where we go places where the text never intended for us to go. And we come up not with God's ideas. It's not like we're chasing after God's ideas, but we found our own idea that we find is so helpful, that we find is so um, appealing and winsome. It's like, how do we impose our idea into the the text? And so like my encouragement for pastors and for ministry leaders is um, be a, an individual committed to God's thoughts. And, um, and we've got scripture, we've got a, a tradition of history, um, we've got creeds. I mean, we've got so many things that are available to us that, you know, this is kind of like my view in scholarship as I was going through my PhD. I was like, if I cannot find one person who has come to at least uh, to discuss something similarly to what I'm talking about, that's probably a good idea for me to stay away from that topic. <laughs> like that is heresy. Like you'll get to a place of heresy, you know? Um, I think it was Thomas Aquinas who um, said, you know, like theology um, is talking about um, and it leads us to God. Um, and um, and I think that's so important where it's like, okay, if you're a person who is not taught by God, uh, but you're teaching people about God, like that's horrible, you know, and that's so dangerous and there's going to be an accounting to you. Um, and if you're teaching people about God, but it doesn't lead to God, then that's heresy. And um, and we need to be really careful about those things. And so, um, yeah, I would just encourage you that um, to, to root yourself in, in tradition, in the scriptures. Um, and when I say tradition, I don't mean it in like this. Uh, there's no other way. Like all the church fathers got it right. They didn't. Augustine absolutely butchered Psalm 82. Um, he didn't have a great understanding of Hebrew that he himself talks about in confessions, you know? And I think that, but all this should create humility in our, in our hearts. Like somebody like Augustine that I really value could have maybe butchered Psalm 82. Like, oh, okay, great. Um, like, like, let's be a people of humility as we approach the scriptures and as we approach other people. Um, and if we're going to find confidence in anything, let's find our confidence in Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Joel, thank you so much for your time today and uh, would recommend people your your book that came out this year, Hidden Peace, and uh, excited to be able to chat in person in a year's time and uh, yeah. just continue to do the work of the Lord and helping teach people in theology. And again, I know people just like myself who discovered your work on a podcast. I'm sure there's people that right now are saying, oh, I got to learn more about this guy. And so head to Instagram and uh, check out uh, your work and we'll obviously have everything linked, but uh, thanks for talking church today and I hope to see you soon. You bet. Thanks, Logan.